Uh, well, uh, we're going to continue on, and um, I'm, I'm uh, very thankful for uh, Anatole Williams. Yes. Uh, I think most of us Joe here have uh, benefited from his ministry in so many tremendous ways. I know uh, I have. I've been sharing with people all week about when I first started in Teen Challenge. You know, I was a PK, and PKs think they know more than they actually do, pastors, kids. They no, they don't. <laughs> and we need those moments uh, to, to, to figure that out. I went to Bible school, and, you know, we were doing hermeneutics, and we were doing, uh, we did the poetry of the Old Testament. You know, it's these learning Hebrew uh, letters. And then I come into Teen Challenge, and none of that <laughs> applied to what I was doing here. It's like, where is the Hebrew poetry in my ministry here? And it was a completely different culture, and I thank God uh, for Brother A and uh, just being able in that first year, if, you, if you're just beginning this leadership process, and I know we have some of our newer staff from this center and from others, if you're beginning, find somebody that's been in this, that's been resilient, uh, that is engaged in it, that is clear focus, like Greg was talking about, that has that calling close to their heart, and follow after them and learn from them. And that first year, boy, I did a lot of learning because I had to really understand the culture of Teen Challenge and reaching addicts and reaching people in recovery. And Brother A was, was uh, the, the cornerstone of that. So I'm, I thank God for him. I thank God for serving the trenches for 15 years. And I'm excited to hear what he has to yes. share with us today. So if you would welcome Brother uh, Reverend Anatole Williams. <laughs> Get this. Well, praise the Lord. I am... Uh, I am always simply humbled by whenever God gives me an opportunity to share. And I'm, I'm humbled because, one, I know I stand on the shoulders of giants, and that, that's just not being, you know, cliche. It's, it's, it's the truth. One of, them, one of them is here, and even Brother Lindbergh, who just stepped out, he mentioned about having learned from me. But how I many know Proverbs 27 17 says, Iron sharpens iron? And, and what the, the part I love about, the, the, about that verse that's not talked about a lot, uh, it, it, a lot it says, so a, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And so uh, we have not simply been co-laborers in the Lord in this ministry and in the trenches doing what God has called us to do. But God, God knitted us together as friends and we have been sharpening each other for the last 15 years. And I am so grateful for that because uh, he's a huge part of who I am today as well, as well as many others. And, you know, uh, uh, I, you know I put this picture up here for, for a reason, not so I can simply brag, even though uh, uh, I want to. Uh, but, but I want to boast in the Lord uh, for a number of dis different reasons. Brother Greg Dill, he mentioned earlier, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, I came off the streets of New Orleans out of one of the worst projects in the city of New Orleans, lived in several of the housing projects in the city of New Orleans, got caught up into the lifestyle of addiction at the age of 10 years old because that was what was prevalent in that environment. That's what I aspired to become, a dope dealer. And, 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 and it, it, it was in my face every day when I walked out the door, walking to school, that's what I saw, dope dealers. And that's what I wanted. Not knowing the path of destruction that would follow it. Got so caught up in the drugs and alcohol uh, that I ended up at, at, at a very hopeless, broken place. And my mom, you know, at the point where my mom And my mom told me at one point when I knocked on her door not to ever knock on her door again because f as far as she was concerned, she didn't have a son. It broke me even further. And I was sharing with Greg last night. I was sitting in the d drug house and the Holy Spirit began to deal with my, my heart. And I didn't know God, far from God, didn't know it was the Holy Spirit. But the, ho uh, the Holy Spirit spoke into my heart and said, if your mom dies today, 
she will die with a broken heart. Something inside me said, I don't want my mom to die <laughs> with a broken heart. And, th- and the Holy Spirit flipped it on me. He said, well, if you die today in this drug house, your mom would have to live the rest of her life with a broken heart. I left the drug house that day and went to a pay phone. Y'all remember those? (laughs) Called my mom collect because I didn't have a quarter. If it was a quarter then. Yeah. Before I could even speak. She she said, Anatole, where are you? I'm coming to get you. She said, when I came into the house this month, Greg may know this, my mom was a New Orleans police officer. She had one son that had already been served, just recently rolled out of penitentiary from an eight-year sentence. And she was watching her other son that was, would possibly end up in penitentiary or dead. She said, where are you? She said, when I came in, she worked a graveyard shift. She said, when I came in tonight, this morning, she said, the Lord had me fall to my knees and pray for you. She said, where are you? I'm coming to get you. She came, got me. We, we got on the phone. We called Greg. He didn't have a residential facility at the time but he was doing Christ. interesting enough God used the, the, even one of the men he spoke to spoke about earlier uh, uh, Pastor Marvin Gorman I didn't know I was just sharing with him I didn't know anything about the whole thing that was happening between him and Jimmy Swagger but 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 how uh, the word the word of God is so powerful because the word of God says that all things are working together for the good of them who love God and are called according to his purpose. And, 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 and so God knew what he had purpose for me well before I even thought about knowing him. And, and he was working it all out because he didn't, he, he didn't allow teen challenge to be dissolved because he knew I was coming. And I wouldn't have, uh, you wouldn't have been there to have, find me a place here. And I'm so, I'm so grateful for all that is doing. You know, the, the word says that God is able to do far more, far more exceedingly and abundantly above what we can even ask and think uh, or think according to the power that works in us. And, and, and when I look at this picture and when I look at my life and where God has brought me from, it's surreal to me. Had a student yesterday. I was coming in, going into my office, and he was going into the storage area, not far from it. And he, he said, good morning, Brother A. And they all called me Brother A. And he said, he said Brother A, I, need, I want to tell you something. He said, every day when I see you, it tells me I can succeed. And that's a that's a part of what I want to get into here today. This is my this is the, the, the greatest blessing God has done in my life. I met my wife in uh, after Teen Challenge in I was sharing with Greg in, in, in Marvin Gorman's church. After Teen Challenge, I was homeless because my mom didn't trust me in her house. So I had nowhere to live. So I was sleeping in an old vehicle I had parked at her house and I would pull it on alongside of the church and living at and, and sleep in that vehicle. Later, Marvin Gorman find out, found out about it, and he, God had allowed his ministry to so be d- dissolved that he was at his original church on Elysian Field Avenue in New Orleans. And he had lived, him and his family, when they first moved to New Orleans, when God called them to come to New Orleans, they had lived in that one room with a bathroom above that church. And he said, I have a place for you. And he let me live in that one room with a bathroom until I met and married my wife. But I had such a passion and desire because of Teen Challenge to live for God and to serve God that I I could have used a number of excuses to fall right back into that lifestyle. But I made the decision that I wanted to live for God. And I lived in that church until I married my wife. And then God called me back to work in the ministry of Teen Challenge here in Memphis. And I was sharing that whole 
whole whole story with God, but God uh, with Brother Greg, but God uh, blessed me with an amazing wife, and and we have beautiful twin girls who are all are married now. My son, he's to the to the my left with his wife. My wife is there uh, between. Uh, her and, and my son-in-law, who my la my daughter got married uh, probably about a year or so ago, uh, and and uh, then this is my daughter Danielle. But her and Gabrielle are friends. I mean, are twins. Um, and this is her husband Patrick on the end, and 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 this is the greatest blessing, I believe God has done in my life out of out of everything He has He has He has accomplished. But I, you know, I say that to say that I'm a, a graduate of, of this ministry. Uh, we were in a house behind here. You talk about history. I was sharing with Greg. We were in a house behind where we are, where our Hope House is now uh, when I came into the program. And uh, had maybe 14, 15 guys in the program at that time. Uh, many are, were from New Orleans. Um, you could have called us New Orleans Teen Challenge at the time. Uh, but, 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 uh, even with that, that those humble, and it, we, you know, there's a lot more history to that even before I got here, but even with those humble beginnings, uh, God used the ministry of Teen Challenge to literally, literally transform my life. He blessed me with a beautiful family. I never saw any of this coming. I never saw when I walked through the doors of Teen Challenge, what, what God was about to do, but he had been working. And I tell the men all the time, I said, do you understand that your 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 future is God's past. Your future is God's past. Our future is God's past. What he has for us is already done. He he is just waiting for us to walk in it. And while you're waiting on God, he's saying, I'm waiting on you. It's already done. We, we simply need to believe God for the manifestation of what's already done. Amen? Amen. All of my kids are doing far more than I would have ever, than I ever thought about doing when I was their age. They're all in their early 20s. They all have graduated college. They all have great careers. And I'm saying this all to you for a reason as I get into this presentation. But, but, but they're all a college graduates. They all have great careers. They all married great spouses. They all, each of them are homeowners. In their early 20s. Yeah, yeah, come on. I was homeless. <laughs> I did. No license. <laughs> no insurance. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no tags. <laughs> but I had a car. <laughs> uh, God, God, God blessed me when I walked through the doors of Teen Challenge. I didn't even have a GD. I was drop kicked out of school in New Orleans. I say drop kicked out because I, I was a, uh, I thought it was a great idea to burglarize schools. And so the, the, they kicked me out of, out of school and I couldn't go to any public school in the city. So when I walked through the doors of Teen Challenge, I had no education. I uh, could probably read on about a fourth grade level. And, and, and went through the program, not even knowing that God was using the program to increase my comprehension. Went down to the take the GED test with a group of students while I was a direct care staff. Scared to death that if I fail, man, how, what are they going to think of me? And turns out I passed the GED test. And again, I'm, I'm sharing all this with you for a reason. Because this is important as it relates to the, 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 the men or women that you're working with rec in recovery with to overcome a lifestyle of addiction. I, I, maybe we don't realize how uh, some of the other dynamics, which I'm going to get into in a minute, of dealing with people that are coming out of a lifestyle of addiction. But the Holy Spirit is really... Uh, uh, dealt, with me, dealt with me on these things uh, over the years and how he's revealed to me if you really want to overcome and be successful you need to understand addiction dynamics 
and I, and, and I want to get into that. But I, 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 uh, I ended up getting my GED. I was encouraged by the executive director at the time to pursue college, but I was scared to debt to do it because I, I didn't think I was smart. I thought I was dumb. Still don't think I'm smart. But, 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 so it took me a while to do that. Then I didn't know how I would pay for it. Fast forward, I end up back in New Orleans working at the Orleans Parish Sheriff's Office, the same prison that I frequented myself, working as what they call a CIT, a counselor in training, uh, with having no background in secular counseling, only, only experience I had was having worked in Teen Challenge for the years I had worked in Teen Challenge. But they hired me. Hurricane Katrina, come, well, I joined the Navy Reserves at that time as well, not even knowing whether they would accept me because of my drug history and my criminal record, but not even realizing, too, that it was almost 11 years after I had completed this program. So I went and applied. I said, the worst case scenario is, they say, you can't do it. They turned me down. But I ended up getting into the Navy Reserves, and I did that in order to go back to school. Because I'm consistently thinking about how do I elevate myself so I can be a greater instrument or tool in the hand of God. And I, th and I, and I think it's important that we're encouraging our staff and our students to do that. I, I wasn't doing it so I can impress men. But I wanted to be able to be a greater tool or instrument in the hand of, hand of God. And on top of that, what it, what, it, what it was doing was increasing the value I placed on myself. Because drugs and alcohol and a lifestyle of addiction depletes you of your self-worth and your value. And, and, and so I was con consistently looking for how do I, how do I increase my self-worth? How, how do I help myself feel that I have value again? Now, it, it's one thing, you know, where it, and, and I came in the Teen Challenge during that time where, you know, it, 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 it was always all you need is Jesus. And, and I believe that all you need is Jesus. But but you also you also have to live in this world. And know how to live in this world. But let me let me let me let me, let me move forward. Teaching recovering addicts uh, uh, coping skills from a biblical perspective. Look at my uh, screen here so I can. So here's my introduction. The greatest challenge for many recovering addicts is learning to appropriately cope with the pressures of life. That's, that's one of the greatest challenges for those uh, 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 in recovering from a lifestyle of addiction. Learning how uh, to cope with the pressures of life without the use of mood altering chemicals. And I use mood altering chemicals. Uh, because that's primarily the individuals we're dealing with. But, 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 you know, people look for other, they have other negative coping methods that they follow or things that they use to cope with life. And you don't hear a whole lot talked about that. But, and, and, hope, and I, and I, I want to get into that just a little bit as we go through this. Once drugs and, and or alcohol are no longer part of life, an addict must not only learn how to cope without drugs and alcohol, but they must also learn how to appropriately cope with happiness and or heartache. And or heartache. They got to learn, you know, addicts, when I was, you know, everything that came, whether it was good or bad, was a reason or excuse to get high. And I couldn't wait for Mardi Gras. I stockpiled my drugs and alcohol for Mardi Gras. It's coming up soon, huh? Yeah. And before noon on Mardi Gras day, I was already passed out from drugs and alcohol. But everything was about, everything was about getting high and using. Everything. Every holiday, every event, everything was about using. We, we, we end up in that place, which, uh, again, I'll talk about more. We end up in that place where we're living to use and using to live. That becomes a, the, a, our lifestyle. Helping the addict learn appropriate coping skills 
in managing life stressors is key to successful recovery in, suc in a successful life. And I believe there are key biblical principles to support recovering addicts and coping with uh, life stressors, which I want to uh, uh, get into without resorting to using uh, mood altered chemicals. Here's a couple of facts, uh, drug addiction facts. Data collected by the Centers for Disease, the CDC and Prevention from 2020 and 2021 estimates that an average of 265 Americans die each day from a drug at overdose. 265 die each day in this country from drug overdose. What does that say to us? That says to us that this problem is, con is, is getting progressively worse, consistently worse. And, 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 and so we, 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 we need to look beyond simply them going through a program. What else will it take for them to be successful and not fall back to that? Watch this. According to NADA, National Institute on Drug, Drug Addiction, as many as 80% of all jailed offenders, whether the crime was drug related or not, have a problem with substance abuse. 80%. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at my screen and I, I didn't even cover my definition. I had, I had a, I have a very simple definition here for coping, uh, coping skills. Coping skills are tools people use to deal with, with life struggles. Uh, uh, and many of those that end up caught up in the throes of addiction never learn appropriate coping skills to deals with, deal with the struggles of life. This, is, this one kind of got ahead of, well, I, I think I sent him maybe the wrong PowerPoint too. But let me give you another statistic since I don't, I don't have them on the screen here. So I, I think I sent... Uh, him the wrong PowerPoint. Here's another, uh, here's, here, here's another one. According to American addiction centers and other sources, 40% of recovering addicts relapse. 40 to 60% of recovering addicts relapse. Now, I don't know how much of that applies uh, to faith-based pro pro faith programs such as 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 uh, adult and teen challenge, but I'm sure there's a significant percentage even there that relapses. Coping skills. Coping skills are are tools people use to deal with life struggles. Tools. So one of the things I think we should be looking at. When we're, when we're discipling those coming out of a lifestyle of addiction is how do we equip them with tools to cope or deal with issues in life? How do we equip them to cope or deal with uh, the struggles of life? But, or, or even when, because they associate something good happening even with going party and using drugs. Let's celebrate. Let's go get high, let's drink. When something good happens, when something bad happens, let me make myself feel better. Let me go get high. Let me find something to drink. So everything in, in, in your life as an addict is about getting high, is about partying. Let me go through just quickly some uh, what, addiction dynamics that, that, that we need to consider uh, in working with individuals coming out of a lifestyle of addiction. First one, addiction is both substance and behavior related. And that's what I was alluding to a little bit when I was talking uh, earlier about other ways that people look at coping and, and, and coping with the difficulties of life. Uh, substance, uh, the, the behavior rela re related ad addictions are just as destructive as substance related. But you're not hearing a whole lot talked about, not even in the church, and there's a lot of it in the church. 
and you got people who have behavior related addictions that are sitting there looking down on those who have substance related addictions as if they don't have any problem because you may not see theirs they're able to better hide it or disguise it so it's not it and, and it's not talked about you got pastors in the pulpit mm. Mm. that's dealing with a behavior related addiction yeah. and, and you know I, I uh, think the last mission driven I had a I had a diagram in in my presentation of the brain and and if you if you do the research you find out that the substance and the behavior uh, related addiction is the same it's having the same effect on the brain regardless of what the addiction is But for whatever reason, we're not dealing with that. I, you know, I'm, I'm a chief in the Navy, and I've been responsible for a unit over in Vegas. And it's been interesting having to fly to Vegas with, you know, it's called Sin City for a reason. You, know, you have legalization of marijuana there. You have uh, prostitution that's uh, legal there. Um, I went by the Las Vegas Teen Challenge just to visit and see how they're doing and, and uh you know, I was hearing from one of the staff the struggle they have with, with the fact that marijuana is legal, with yeah. the program there, yeah. the challenge that 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 puts them in. Um, but you walk into the casinos, and the casinos are packed with people gambling. Get off the plane in the airport. The airport looks like a casino. People are sitting there waiting on their flights, gambling. It's a behavioral addiction and, and it's addiction that many uh, many of them are not even seeing as destructive in their life and and no one is helping them to understand you have a life controlling problem and these same people and this one it gets into that many addicts also have cross addictions many of those people also have, have are alcoholics they're gambling they're likely on drugs at the same time and it's destroying their lives. They're losing their homes. They're losing everything. But yet no, no one is really talking about the behavioral part. In Teen Challenge, in Adult Teen Challenge, you have a lot of cross addictions. I tell guys often in, in, in the program, I say, you know, when I got in Teen Challenge and I got off drugs, I realized that that was the least of my problem. I had a whole lot of other addictions that I wasn't even conscious of or aware of because of the substance. And I thought the sub when I walked, when I came to Teen Challenge, I didn't come off, come to Teen Challenge because I thought I, I, I didn't think I had any other problem but shooting dope and smoking crack. If I can just leave that alone, my life will be fine. That was, that was the thing that God was using to get me to the place to get completely delivered and set free. He knew that it was deeper than that. But, but, but the substance and, and the alcohol and the drugs, of course, that opens up the door for you to get involved in other behavioral addictions as well. And if you have an addictive personality and you're in Teen Challenge, you're an addict, you have... A, 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 a potential of, of having cross addictions or transference of, of addiction or both or both you can't just say well hey the drugs is the problem and I just need to be free from drugs and alcohol you, you got to be able to look at uh, whatever other day and stop hiding that if it's sex addiction if it's gambling or whatever it is you got to deal with that too and we got to be able to help people uh, uh, get honest even about those behavioral addictions in their lives. I, s I can't, and, and, and I'm sure uh, uh, other staff here, and Brother, Brother Greg, you've probably uh, uh, dealt with students who, after they've gotten clean and sober, you see the compromise in other areas in terms of behavior, but they're not willing to deal with that. 
I, you know, I, 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 I recently sent one home for that very reason because I was discerning. He ain't, he's, not, he's not done yet. He thinks he's good because he's simply clean and sober now. Yeah. And, and it's the other behavioral stuff that's going to lead him back to the same place. And he don't realize, or worse, if he don't deal with it. Here's another one. Addicts live in a state of denial. Speaking of that the individual I just mentioned. Some of these guys, we can sit and we can, we can you know, uh, we can communicate truth and impart truth to them, but they, ne they, they refuse to connect. But they refuse to connect. They, 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 they choose to live in, in denial. Uh, addicts have a distorted view of life. What do I mean by that? Uh, the distorted view has to, it, it, the, the continual use of drugs and alcohol create this fantasy of life of always being good, always be feeling good. And so, and so they chase, con whether, they, whether it's with drugs or alcohol or a behavioral issue, they're always chasing a feel good. Why do, why do the, the, the men or women that come into Teen Challenge, why do they struggle so much with, with the program? It don't feel good. It don't feel good. And they want to feel good. And, and, and they don't understand it's feeling good that, that consistently is causing them to destroy their life. Chasing what feels good. Chasing what feels constantly chasing what feels good. And, and, and I consistently will say to guys, I said, well, I, I, I'll, I'll bring it. I'm going to get into uh, another illustration I used just in a minute with guys. But I will say I will ask the question. I, 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 I will say to them. Uh, if you are at home. Laying on your couch with your remote. Do you want to change? You don't want to change. You want to say it feels good. You, you want to stay there with that remote in your hand and just be comfortable. Change never feels good. Not, not, not change that will bring uh, long-term success. And I would say to them, if it doesn't feel good here, good! That means it's having the effect, the impact that it's supposed to have. It's having that. It's, it's not, it hasn't been me putting myself in comfortable situations that have allowed me to find success. It hasn't been comfortable uh, in the military. It hasn't been comfortable. I'm back in school again working towards my doctorate. Not because it feels good. Because I want, again, to be an a, 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 a instrument in God's hand that he can use in greater ways. Not so I can impress anyone. Not so it can give me some sort of, will it feel good once I accomplish it? Absolutely. But that's called delayed gratification, which is another thing that addicts struggle with. Uh, But, 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 but the continued use of drugs and alcohol create a fantasy of life, always, uh, of always being, feel, uh, being and feeling good and blind them to the risk and consequences of using. It blinds you to the risk and consequences of, of, of using. I mean, of, uh, of using. And so... Uh, in order for them to, to, uh, to, to connect with, hey, I need to change if I don't want these consequences, they got to stop using. They got to understand that you got to stop using if, if, uh, if you want, you got to get out of this fantasy. You got to come into the reality that what you're doing uh, is, is, is it, there's consequences that are associated with that. Addicts become increasingly dependent on drugs and alcohol uh, to cope with life. Uh, living to use, using to live, the ability, they, they, they end up 
losing any ability to manage their own life effectively. It, it diminishes completely. I remember ending up in that place where I had no ability to manage my own life. No ability to manage my own life because I was so dependent on drugs and alcohol. Everything I did, you know, I remember uh, uh, working, I, I, I got a job. I thought, you know, I said, well, if I stop, if I stop trying to sell drugs and be a dope dealer and go and get me a job, and uh, maybe I can change my life that way. Still, they're not, you know, con con even thinking about God or having a relationship with God. So I, I, I went into the restaurant business, ended up working in the Jackson Brewery there in New Orleans uh, and, and, and in a restaurant there and becoming a chef. Uh, the using began there again uh, because anywhere I went, uh, I had to take me with me. Right. And so I, I, I'm working there. And I'm getting a paycheck every week. And before I could even get home, the paycheck was gone. Yeah. Did, it, it knew I had obligations and responsibilities. But I, before I could get home, the first thing, the thing that's primary was using drugs and alcohol. I went straight, I cashed my check, went straight to the, to the dope dealer. And then after that, I would tell myself, well, next week I won't do the same thing. And it becomes a vicious cycle where you're consistently telling yourself you can do it on your own. Or if you, if you change this or that, you can do something different. And, and, you, and you consistently end up in the same place and it gets progressively worse each time. The, the addict never learned how to live effectively. And this, this is an important point I wanted to get into because uh, I believe the Holy Spirit helped me to realize that uh, it, it, it's, my, it, it's learning how to live effectively that, that keeps me from falling into destructive behavior and into destructive things. First, uh, uh, understanding that there, there, there are things that God never intended for me to engage or be involved in. He never intended for that. He intended for me to learn how to live uh, the way he created me to live. Um, they, 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 the addict, and here's how I know, the addict never learned to live effectively uh, uh, or, or develop appropriate coping skills because if they had, they would have never engaged using drugs and alcohol. If you know how to live, people who have learned how to live, it doesn't matter what type of home you came out of either. You know, I think a lot of people uh, think that uh, it's typically those coming out of uh, areas that are impoverished or drug infested in, 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 in neighborhoods, that they're the ones that are more, more uh, prone to ending up in addiction. But you have a lot of them, and we see a lot of them coming in the adult and teen channel that came out of a very good home, where they were even raised in the church. Yeah. Yeah. Came out of homes where they had privilege. Yeah. That, the, that their mom and dad provided everything that they needed and, ha and, and, and was trying to be a good influence in their life. But, they, but in, and in some cases, that could be more of detriment to them than it was for you to come out of an environment like I came out of and get caught up into it because you rebel against that and you have a attitude of entitlement and think that things were always supposed to go your way because you always you had this so-called good life everything was and, and you you've already planted the seed that life is always supposed to feel good and they and, and so a big part of learning to live effectively is who you choose to allow to influence your life. Who you choose to allow to influence your life. The dominant influences in your life. And I brought up, I was showing a picture about my, my, uh, my, my family and my kids and talking about where they are in their life right now. And the reason I was bringing that up is because uh, me and my wife and I were very intentional as they were growing up about wanting to be the dominant influence in their lives. The one thing we knew is that uh, we had really a 
a, 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 a very minimal amount of time to be that the influence, the kind of influence we needed to be in their life. They were leaving, going to school. They were, being, they were hanging out around friends. They were listening to teachers. They, had a, they were looking at television at different times. So we had to be very intentional about uh, being that dominant influence and speaking into their lives and, po- and, and imparting into their lives uh, uh, because I wanted desperately for them never have to have the experience that I had with drugs and alcohol. Now, they know about it because I told them about it. But they, were, they were not yet born whenever I was in my addiction. Um, but I used my past to, 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 to guide them. But I consistently worked to be that dominant influence. Me, my wife and I both, uh, uh, spending time with them, uh, uh, talking to them about the things that were happening in the world and how they were processing that, how they were coping with the stuff maybe they were dealing with at school and, 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 and that they were seeing maybe on television or hearing from their friends, how, how they're processing that. Uh, uh, because I, I wanted, you, you know, I was listening to Greg early and I, I was thinking about how resilient you were, you know, I was there in, in, in New Orleans for Hurricane Katrina. Similarly, lost everything in terms of my home and everything. But, but, but the Holy Spirit has a way of building a resilience in us to overcome uh, whatever we, we, we end up having to face. And, 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 and I wanted my kids to learn how to live in the world with not becoming, but not become of the world. It's the same thing we need to be working with these the, the, the men and women coming out of addiction to learn. Not simply how to worship God and how to pray, but how to live in the world and not become of the world. Addiction creates an intense desire for instant gratification. That's why you see a lot of men and women struggle going through programs such as Adult and Teen Challenge because they like instant gratification. They want to feel good and they want to feel good now. And if, if things are happening that don't uh, make them feel good, they're ready to throw in a towel. They're ready to run out the door. Uh, guys, we try to encourage guys all the time going through the program uh, uh, not to go back to their home area because of the familiarity there and, and it puts them at high risk in, in, uh, to end up falling back into uh, that lifestyle again. But it's the most comfortable and easiest thing for them to do. So they quickly look to go and do that. And then not long after you're hearing from them that, man, I'm struggling yeah. or I need help again or I've relapsed or I'm in jail again because they don't want to make the hard decisions. They don't want to make decisions that will make them uncomfortable and so they make the easiest decision and instead of the decisions that will set them up for success i if i'm honest really uh greg you you made uh jokes about me never coming back to new orleans i never wanted to stay in memphis i am not a fan of memphis and bro 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 jay um uh, don't know this part, but I had transitioned at one point over to Raleigh as the, uh, Assembly of God as their outreach pastor and uh, got over there. And uh, I was talking with the pastor at the time because he was wanting me to develop this outreach program called uh, Refuge Memphis. And he has this huge heart for Memphis and wanting to reach uh, Memphis. And he, he, you know, he was talking with me about that. And this is where God gave me the realization that uh, my heart wasn't so much about Memphis. It was really about Teen Challenge, and God simply had called me to Memphis Teen Challenge. And, and so I'm sitting there, and he's talking about, uh, uh, I, I, we need to reach Memphis. And, uh, and I, said, I said, look, look, Pastor, I don't, I don't, uh, God called me to reach people. I don't care where I reach him. He's called me to reach people. Uh, I don't care if it's in Memphis. I don't care if it's in New Orleans. But, but I... I have it, it had always been all the time I've been here. It's been if, if it was left to my choice, I'd have been back in New Orleans a long time ago. And I came here after Hurricane Katrina, after everything had been lost. I was uh, I remember we had planned on going to Superdome. Thank God. Thank God I didn't. 
I, I, I threw very minimal things in the back of my truck, put all my, I grabbed my safe for some reason with our important documents in it. That was, I say for some reason, that was the Lord had me to grab that. And I threw that in the back of the truck and we, we started driving up here and I had my in-laws in the back of the truck with a small truck, small little Chevy Silverado. And uh, all my kids were piled in there with us and we're driving up to Memphis, what normally took about, uh, uh, what, took, what took about six hours, took us 10 hours um, in the traffic. But the whole time I'm praying and I'm worshiping God in that vehicle, not knowing what God was was going was going to do. Got here, got in a hotel that a friend of ours here had gotten for us to stay in. Uh, and and uh, when we went to bed, the news was saying, hey, New Orleans was narrowly missed again. Woke up the next morning. The city's filling up with water. And I'm like, oh, my God, what are we going to do now? Because we, we could only stay in that hotel one night. Uh, and friends, some friends of ours from Teen Challenge uh, allowed us to uh, uh, stay at their home with them for a while. Uh, and then I was asked uh, by the director at the time to come if I would be willing to come back and work with Teen Challenge. And I said, no. I said, I'm going home. I'm going back to New Orleans. I'm going back to my job at the sheriff's office as a counselor. And uh, so when we finally got the break to come to, to go to New Orleans and, and, and uh, uh, see what was left, uh, the building where I work was gone. <laughs> uh, so there was no more programs there for me to go. And so I came back uh, and talked to the director and said, uh, John DeSantis, who was there last night, and I said, hey, I believe the Lord wants me to come back here. <laughs> and uh, ended up coming back to work. Yeah, I ended up coming back. So God brought me full circle right back because it's my calling. It's who I am in and. and uh, Mike was talking last night about the DNA, uh, and Cindy said, and I, uh, I agree with her, if you cut me, I bleed uh, ATC, um, and, and, and that, that, that's who I am. It's not simply what I do, it's who I am, and I thank God for that because God has used Teen Challenge not just in terms of me changing my life and saving me and delivering me and giving me a hope in the future, but I've been able to raise my family. And see them not, uh, uh, not thrive yeah. and have the life that God purposed for them. Yeah. And teach them and use the tools that God gave me in Teen Challenge to teach them as well. So, so uh, somebody said, I think last night or at some point, that it, 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 it's not just, well, I think it was Cindy talking and saying, it's not just that it impacts the individual. This changes families. Yeah. It has such a powerful ripple effect where the, the spirit of God not only moves on the individual, but it moves on their families. It restores relationships. It completely transforms everything. I, I, was, I was talking to a, a lady at our last graduation uh, was there visiting with her with her son. And, and she she began to share that very thing, how him, be, him being here is having such an impact on our entire family. Because that's what it does. That's exactly what it does. But it, 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 creates an, it, it creates an intense desire for instant gratification. And so a big part of uh, what's, uh, what's important for us in working with those coming out of a lifestyle of addiction is helping them learn delayed gratification. We have to help them learn delayed delay gratification uh, because... That intense desire for instant gratification almost makes it impossible for them for them to learn it. They don't realize that that they, that 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 it's just them having this intense desire to feel good all the time. That's ca keep causing them to be uh, 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 to destroy their life. But that's what addiction does. It creates that this intense desire for instant gratification, even even after. You are free from drugs and alcohol. That's where cross addictions even take place. Transference of addiction. Uh, give you another one that happens uh, uh, in, t in Memphis. I don't know about in Louisiana, uh, but in Memphis and, and in Heartland Teen Challenge, guys put on an average of about 60 pounds. Why? Because they've transferred addiction to food. Now, they didn't, they didn't care about having a meal. When they were out there actively using. It's the biggest deal in the world. It's the biggest deal in the world. 
it, it's it's almost it's well, it, it's laughable to hear some of them complain about the food when you weren't eating just a week ago. <laughs> food was the last thing on your mind. But now food is the most important thing. Uh, it, 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 it was, it, and, and I'll remind them, I'll, I'll share with them that, you know, when I went through Teen Challenge, you know, when we were in that house back there, we didn't have a food bank. We didn't have, uh, we waited for people to bring donations of chicken and this or that. And we had one lady, her name was uh, 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 Joyce Innocent. And we called it her, we called her the Dennett Can Lady because she had a warehouse full of Dennett cans of food. And I was working in the kitchen. And she and I go with her to the warehouse and she said, well, get you some cans of stuff. I don't know what they are. None of them have labels. They're dented. And, and I, we'd bring them back and then she'd give us boxes of stuff. And uh, whatever we opened up, that's what we had for dinner that day or lunch or whatever it was. And uh, uh, I remember opening up a cup of uh, a box of pancake mix and weevils just fly all out of it. But that's what we had. I threw that away, of course, I didn't use it, but um, it, 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 for me, it really challenged me in terms of whether I really wanted to change my life. Because if you, it, 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 one of the things I say consistently, because I could have used uh, those things as an excuse to walk out the door. They don't even want to feed you right here. You know, a lot of these guys get on the phone and manipulate their family about how, how bad the program is. And the food is horrible here and the staff is just mean. And this is cause, because they're always looking and reaching for something to, to, to make the easy decision. Uh, addiction is directly related to lifestyle. Meaning how we used to live dictates a significant part of what, what happens in our lives. Speaking of people, places, and things. People, places, and things, they use this concept in, 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 they emphasize this concept. I worked in secular treatment after Teen Challenge for almost four years at the sheriff's office. And the big thing was, was what we were supposed to emphasize is one, 90 meetings in 90 days in treatment. Make sure you work in a step, make sure you find your sponsor, right? All, all because all of that is about really maintenance. It's not about transformation. It's about maintenance. It's not about change. It's about maintenance. If you do these things, you won't pick up. You won't use. And, 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 and so consistently that we would also uh, talk about people, places and things. But I didn't I never really uh, saw where they really focused on it uh, uh, the way it needed to be focused on people, places and things is what has allowed me to live the life God wants me to live. Uh-oh. He won't be able to record. That's what he's... Okay. Just hanging. Yeah, people... People, places, and things uh, are very powerful if... if if we're, if one, if we're going to be able to maintain uh, our recovery as well as live for God. Uh, it's, 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 it's me making a conscious decision to change the people, change the, 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 the well, one is if you change the people, the places and things change. If you begin to associate with the right people, in the right places, doing the right things, your life can't help but be different. Can't help but be different. So, so identifying the right people to associate with is, is important. Look, social networks for the addict, social networks uh, become a part of their identity. The guys that end up, end up we saw the... the uh, the uh, stats on relapse. If you go, if you if you're able to go there and really look at why so many are relapsing, it typically will point back to the people place, uh, the people that they're associating with, that they're going back to the same places where they were uh, involved before, and, and 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 it's causing them to fall back into the same behaviors or the same things again. 
Uh, the other the, the other part of the lifestyle issue is that that addicts secretly and I say secretly uh, because they don't necessarily talk about it. They secretly believe that that they won't have fun uh, or friends in a lot ha having a life without they won't have a life without having friends uh, funny. They won't have fun friends or anything without uh, uh, drugs and alcohol. That's what they believe. Secretly, they believe that, but they don't, they don't talk, they, because they look at the Christian life and think it's boring. It's not any fun uh, uh, because all they know is what they've always been doing. And so a, a part of, I think, what our responsibility is as as Christian leaders, particularly in Teen Challenge, is is helping them to see that uh, living for God uh, is more fun than the way you've been living. It's more enjoyable, and then you don't have the negative consequences to worry about uh, uh, in doing so. Here's another one. Humans from birth are conditioned to live according to the, the, the world standard, which is, a, which is a huge problem because uh, worldly standards is what leads to addiction. Living according to worldly standards uh, creates that inability to cope appropriately with issues in life. When you live according to the world standards. Addicts tend, uh, addicts are, are, and people, a lot of people in general, are more world conscious. And we're, we're more world conscious from, we're, we're conditioned to be more world conscious from birth. We're not conditioned to be God conscious from we're, we're from birth. We're we're conditioned to be world more world conscious. Then and, and, and so we have to learn. We have to come into relationship with God. And, and even after you come into relationship with God, you have to learn to be God conscious. You have to consistently practice being God conscious and not world conscious. That's the way you keep yourself from becoming of the world, even though you're in the world, by maintaining God consciousness. Some, some use the term practicing the presence of God. Uh, addicts, addicts need to compensate for the deficit uh, in coping, and they, and they do this uh, by alleviating stress with the, with the use of alcohol, with the use of drugs and alcohol, or, what, or whatever the behavior is. Uh, in other words, they self-medicate against painful feelings and or social anxieties. They look for uh, ways to make themselves feel good, basically, when it comes to uh, uh, dealing with or coping with life. Here's a verse that I love by, by Paul and that I use pretty consistently in Teen Challenge. It says, everything is permissible for me, Paul speaking, Said everything is permissible for me, but all, not all things are beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything and brought under its power, allowing it to control me. And I'll, I'll say to the men oftentimes when I'm doing a group session with them, look, you know, right now I got a few dollars in my pocket. I got a few dollars in the bank. If it, 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 it's permissible for me, if I chose to do it, to walk right down the street, I know where to go find drugs. But I'm making a conscious decision because of my relationship with God not to do that. Not to do that. It's permissible. Paul said, and Paul said, you can do it. You got permission to do it. But he said, understand, if you do it, it, it it's not beneficial. God never overrides our free will. You, you, Greg was talking earlier about uh, 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 dismissing and somebody asked a question. Um, about how you deal with that. One of the things I was just talking yesterday with the staff and I said to the staff, look, uh, something Brother Jay said earlier when he was talking, we can't want it more for them than they want it for themselves. And if, 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 if you have, uh, you know, I, 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 I believe we work to give every individual every possible opportunity to do what it, to, to do what it takes to allow the Holy Spirit to change their life. 
But there's a point where you have to uh, have discernment and say, wait a minute, they're just refusing to connect with what they need to connect with. They're, they're unwilling to do it. Uh, and, and you can't sacrifice the other people that are there for help for an individual that's not willing to do what it takes. If they ain't done yet, ain't nothing you can do to, 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 to make. And be it far from me, and this is one of the things I love to say to them, be it far from me to deprive you of what needs to happen in your life for you to get to the place where you want God in your life to change your life. You got to go, you, 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 look, here's one of my favorite sayings, and guys have heard me say it, okay, you're wasting good high time. Yeah, you're wasting good high time. If you're here and you really don't want this and you're trying to use this as a good idea, you're wasting good high time. Go finish. Or let it finish you. Whatever, That's your choice. But, but I'm here. I'm available to you if you want help. I'm, uh, if you want it, I'll give it to you. But if you don't want it, the Holy Spirit ain't even forcing it on you. Why should I? Why should I? If you're not done, you're not done. Uh, uh, but that's the attitude we want to help the people we're working with to have. Hey, I can do it. But is this something that will benefit me and help me? Or will it cause me to end up in a, in a place where I'm enslaved? Uh, 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 real quick, I'm going to get into uh, to, to this. I use an illustration all the time with guys who come into the program that are struggling. I'll take a bottle. And, and they're struggling. They're struggling with all the first thing they'll say is, Man, all these rules. <laughs> and, I, and, and I'll sit them down in my office, and I, I, I usually will have a water bottle on my desk or something. I'll flip it over, and I said, what's wrong with this bottle? And he said, it, it's upside down. And I said, yeah, this is how you've been living. This is how you've been living. And, and you've been living this way for so long that you believe upside down is right side up. And I said, when you walk through the doors of this program, all we simply did was flip you right side up. But because you haven't lived this way in so long, it don't feel right. right. But I said, if you allow the Holy Spirit, if you allow God to begin to work in your life, you'll begin to, you'll begin to feel good about how you're living. Because the Holy Spirit will help you to see that you're living, you're now living right side up. So here, here, here's, here's, here's a few things. Using drugs and alcohol is, of course, living upside down. Living promiscuously is living upside down. Lying, manipulating, stealing, attempting to deceive others is living upside down. Uh, living, for the world, living for worldly pleasures is living upside down. Living right side up is living clean and sober. Live, finding a wife, you find a good thing. I found a good thing. Uh, um, Elijah, you, have you found a good thing? <laughs> uh, making themselves accountable, taking responsibility for themselves and others is living right side up, living for God and not for themselves. And I was saying to the staff yesterday, what, keeps, what has kept me humble is maintaining an attitude of being a servant. Jesus made clear, he said, I didn't come into this world to, to be served. The Son of Man came into the world to serve. And as long as I maintain the attitude of being a servant, these men, the people that God places in our care, are not called to serve us. We're called to serve them. And, and, and we have to consistently remind ourselves for that the blessing, the blessing is in serving. That's how God blesses our lives. We should, as believers, we should be consistently look, looking at for ways to serve, to, save, to serve others, uh, in particular the, the, the drug addicts and the downtrodden and, and, and the people that are, 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 are struggling. Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 4, 17 and 24 says this, uh, uh, therefore, in test. Uh, uh, this I say, therefore, and I testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened by uh, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according 
to the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you may that you put on the new man, which is created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Well, the, 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 the important part for me, the most important part of this for me uh, uh, is is that we are helping these men understand what it looks like to put on and put off. Because that's that's the work that they have uh, that they're responsible for doing. Putting on Christ and putting off that old man. And it's, it requires worry. It, cry, it, it requires daily work to put on Christ and to put off that that old man. Cost of uh, addictive lifestyle, deprived of emotional development, uh, uh, lives recklessly, inability to take personal responsibility of one's own life, poor decision making, goals of discipleship in in addiction recovery, support. It, it, it support emotional development. That's what discipleship does. Uh, teaches the value of life. Uh, uh, teaches the importance of accountability and responsibility. Encourages uh, making good decisions. And he, 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 here's, I'm trying to hurry up because I wanted to get into this, this part here and I'm running out of time. But uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Inspirational discipleship. I want to talk real quick about what I call inspirational discipleship. You know, uh, when, when, the, when the student yesterday, when I was going into my office, uh, said to me, and he went into even more detail, I just mentioned the first part of what he said when he said, he said, every, whenever I see you, I believe I can succeed. And, and, and it confirmed what God was speaking into my heart concerning what, I, what I'm calling uh, uh, inspirational discipleship. Because I think we have, the church has, for, what, uh, for some reason, it seems to make discipleship one-dimensional from a spiritual standpoint. Uh, when, when there's a very practical aspect of, of discipleship, I think that is important for uh, the people, people coming out of a lifestyle of addiction to be to, to not just hear, but see. And, and one one of the huge things that has helped me learn how to succeed is the is the is watching and observing the people uh, that were there to help me. How they live, not just what they say. But I'm watching their life. And so I've, I've learned to be intentional uh, about allowing uh, uh, these men going through the pro to see my life. I want them to see how I live. I, I, I you know, I got, I got, you know, military memorabilia in my office. I got my, my education stuff in my, but not so I can brag on myself. I want them to see that. I want them to see that because I want them to believe that if you, if you are surrendered to God, and, and, you, and you put forth the effort and the work to, to do the right things and live for God, you can have success. Doesn't matter your past. Doesn't matter what has happened in your past. God can turn your entire past around. What is inspirational discipleship? Ins inspirational discipleship means that, it, it, that it's just as much practical as it is spiritual. Discipleship with words and more importantly by actions should, number one, communicate uh, Spiritual disciplines. Help them help help. You know, I, I don't want them. To, I, you know, I don't want them just to hear just to believe that I pray because I talk about praying. Or because I talk about practicing certain dis, spiritual discipline or studying God's word or staying in God's word. I want them to be able to see it consistently. This is how I live. It's not what I do. It's how I live. It's not what I do. It's how I live. Uh, trying to get to my. So, so discipleship is not simply about us living for God, but about showing people how to let God live through them. Discipleship with words and more importantly with actions should communicate and demonstrate from a practical perspective. Uh, it should communicate uh, from a practical 
practical perspective how to live in the world and not become of the world. So it's important that they see how we live and that we love how we live, that we love living in the way that we're living. Uh, and, and we have to be intentional about allowing them to see that. Um, you know, people believe half of what we say and all of what they see. And I believe that the, 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 the gentleman yesterday who said that to me, he said that because he's seeing and, and he told me at one point as well. He said, I see I see a consistency in your life. They don't see me come in one way this day and then another way the next day because something is going in my uh, going on in my life and I'm projecting it, projecting it on them. They see that consistency of someone that's putting their faith and trust in God in spite of whatever is happening in their life. In spite of whatever is going on. Um, it communicates and demonstrates healthy boundaries. That there are certain things that 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 uh, as a believer, I'm not going I'm not going to allow myself to say or do. There's 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 even whether it, whether it has to do with uh, watching television or listening to certain music. Uh, uh, they they need to see that we have these boundaries that we establish for ourselves to keep us focused on the Lord and focused on accomplishing whatever it is that God has purposed for us to do. His uh, teaching coping strategy, spiritual support. Uh, of course, we know about our prayer life, fasting and praying, uh, reading and studying the word of God and, and meditating on, on it. Uh, church involvement, community involvement, all are important in terms of, of, of having uh, coping strategies, right? When you're dealing with situations in life. But, but there are also some practical things that, that can help us. That, that, you know, it's important that people coming out of a lifestyle of addiction know that, 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 that they can do to help deal with problems and difficulties in life. You know, I, I, I use it working out. I like working out. Sometimes I like to just go in a, uh, uh, I got a jacuzzi tub in my house and chill in it for a little while and just relax. Um, give myself positive self-talks. Speak positive to myself consistently. Keep uh, uh, inputting positive things into my heart and life. Um, meditate. Meditate on the word of God. Reflect, reflect on the word of God. Psalms 1 lets us know if we do that, it, it, it's going it's to bless. Blessed is the man that walks in the council. It, 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 blessed is the man who uh, whatever it says. But y'all know what it says. But uh, the problem, I'm rushing. That's why I'm doing that. Problem-focused uh, uh, problem coping skills. Learning how to manage their time. Uh, uh, asking for support. A lot of... Uh, a lot of People coming out of a lifestyle of uh, addiction, for whatever reason, struggle to ask for help. I, if, if you need help, ask for it. Uh, establishing healthy boundaries, which I talked about uh, already. Creating a, a to-do li list so you can stay on task and accomplish the things that, that you need to accomplish. Uh, discipling the recovering addict. Discipling, uh, discipleship is about the renewing of the mind. Uh, Christ led leaders help the addict uh, addicted in the process of renewing their mind. Of course, we know Romans 12 and 2 and, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of, of your mind that you may prove that what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The great thing about renewing the mind, uh, uh, particularly in context with uh, us being a long term program because we know short term programs are ineffective is that as the as the mind begins to restore itself and as you're renewing the mind at the same time, uh, you can become completely a new person. You can become a complete and it's not just maintenance. It's not just maintenance, but it's, it's complete renewing of the mind transformation that takes place. Uh, a Christ led leader. Uh, Christ led leaders as Christ led leaders, we want the addicted person to not only admit they have a problem, but to take ownership of the uh, 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 for that. 
the problem that the, the part that they play in creating the problem. One of the big things for me is guys are, uh, taking ownership, yeah. taking ownership. Uh, and there's a there's a uh, a precious promise that's attached to that. He said uh, in First John one nine, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Uh, the goal of discipleship is to help the addicted person establish their identity in Christ and not in the world. And, 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 and oftentimes their identity is, even though they've come into relationship with Christ, their they still don't, they haven't learned their, their identity in Christ. Yeah. And it's, it, it's a process. You know, 2 Corinthians 5.17 is a process. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new cre creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The goal of discipleship is to build and, and or strengthen the self-worth of recovering addicts. So it's, it's, it's important that we're helping them build their self-worth. You know, it, and it's little successes, little accomplishments that help to do that. Uh, encouraging them on a consistent basis helps to build uh, uh, self-worth. Discipleship is dependence on Christ, not a, not a program. For, for strength and help, but it's dependence on Christ and helping them learn what that means. How do I learn to depend on Christ uh, and not simply be seeking instant gratification? Yet in all these things, Romans uh, uh, 8 and 37, yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I'm done. And I was rushing because I'm already past time. <laughs> <laughs> I was already past time. I hate when I put myself in that position, but it is what it is. Amen. 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 Amen.